Hello and welcome to this mini case study presentation from Capra Energy Group. My name is Tamir Drews and I'm the director and lead trainer at Capra Energy. We provide training programs in the areas of LNG trading, pricing, and risk management. Our goal with this mini case study is to focus on a particular type of LNG transaction strategy that's commonly referred to as a reload and re-export. And what we hope that you come away with is an understanding of the optimization process for deciding how to achieve the best risk versus P&L performance outcome for a reload and re-export transaction. Now, we always use actual LNG transactions, projects, and market prices in our training case studies. So we're going to do the same here, even though this is a condensed study. The transaction that we're going to use was initiated in August of this year. One of the most active global marketers and traders of LNG is Germany-based E.ON, which reloaded a cargo of LNG from the Cartagena, Spain regasification terminal, which we see here on the left, onto an LNG tanker that E.ON had chartered, which we see here on the right, named the Kita LNG. Our best estimate of the price at which E.ON acquired the cargo is $9.25 per MMBTU. Now let's take a moment to define what a reload operation is. A reload involves an LNG cargo that was delivered into storage at a regasification terminal at some prior time, but was never processed into a gaseous state. In other words, it was never regasified. But instead, the cargo is reloaded onto another tanker, usually so that it can be re-exported to a new location. There are a number of reasons why this might be done, which we cover when discussing LNG contract structures and obligations, and also portfolio optimization. But for the purposes of this case study, it suffices to say that many such transactions do occur every year, and also Spain is the world's most active hub for reload and re-export transactions. Last year, there were about 82 cargoes that were re-exported, and about half of these, or 40, came from Spain. Spain has a half dozen operational regasification facilities, which are all capable of providing this service, which is not the case for all terminals around the world, and it has ample storage and other logistical advantages, such as its central location, which allows cargoes to be reloaded and then re-exported north to the UK and other parts of Northern Europe, um, east to Asia, and also west to markets such as Latin America. Now, one of the things that we do in our case studies is show how to map the voyage of a cargo. And these days, this can be done using public sources and Google Earth. So we went ahead and we laid down the coordinates for the Kita LNG tankers movements on this map here. Let's zoom in a little bit. Each of these blue squares represents the coordinates of the tanker on a different uh, date and time. And we found that the tanker spent about a week from August 7th through August 14th right by the Cartagena uh, regasification terminal. 
if we zoom in on that, we should be able to get pretty good imagery of that um, terminal. And so we see it here. We see the um, LNG um, storage tanks as well as the other um, regasification infrastructure at the site. So if we get back to our slides, what we're going to try and do is take you through three different monetization strategies that Eon might have pursued with this reloaded cargo. And the question that Eon's trading, marketing, and shipping team would need to answer would be, which of these monetization strategies would provide the best value for this cargo relative to the risk exposure that they were willing to assume? The first strategy that they would have looked at would be a simple spot sale to the market that offered the highest net back price with the tanker immediately embarking on a voyage to that location. Now, when we talk about the net back price, what we're referring to is the net price that Eon would have received after subtracting all of the losses and costs that would have been incurred in shipping the cargo to that final market destination. And so the question is, which market destination would provide the highest price for Eon on a net back basis? And what P&L would that produce relative to Eon's cargo purchase price? Now, we don't get into the detailed calculations here in this mini case study, but we do see that the best net back price available was from India, which would have allowed Eon to net $8.95 per MMBTU after shipping costs, including, by the way, fees for getting through the Suez Canal of about a quarter. But even at this best net back price, Eon would not have broken even against its $9.25 cargo purchase price. So let's look at a second monetization option, which would have involved selling the cargo forward and storing it for some period of time. Now, if we look back at the situation in August, LNG spot prices had reached year-to-date lows due to a mild summer in East Asia and high inventory levels for both LNG and natural gas. There were plenty of cargoes available, which was at least partly due to the fact that Korea Gas, the LNG market's biggest single customer, had deferred about 40 contracted cargoes until the coming winter. But while spot prices were under tremendous downward pressure in August, the market still expected a recovery in the winter. And so winter forward prices were at a large premium to spot prices. Now this is called contango. And we assess LNG forward prices in our service called LNG forward market wire. And we saw the biggest such premium or contango in Northeast Asia. So we're going to focus on that market here, but this same analysis would have been done by Eon for all of the possible market destinations for this cargo. And so the play here is, instead of selling spot and immediately beginning the voyage to the customer market, Eon could, could use the tanker as floating storage and sell the cargo at a forward price for delivery at a future date, which would provide the best price net 
of not only the shipping costs, but also the costs and losses of using the tanker as storage for as long as needed. When we look at that net back price, we see that the best outcome would have been achieved by selling the December 2014 forward price, by selling at that forward price, and delivering in that month. Unfortunately, even this best outcome of $9 falls short of the cargo purchase price of $9.25. So let's go ahead and look at a third monetization option then, which is also a floating storage play, but in this case, Eon would not fix the sale price immediately, either on a spot or forward basis. Instead, Eon would wait and see when the best spot or forward sale opportunity would materialize. And at that point, it would lock in the sale and delivery schedule. Now, this is the riskiest strategy because just as prices might have rebounded off of their August lows, they might have also continued to drop. On the other hand, of all the scenarios we've analyzed, this was the only strategy that might allow Eon to actually make a profit on this cargo. And by waiting before locking in the price or destination, Eon was retaining all of this option value associated with its ability to sell and ship the cargo to the best market that became available. This optionality is very valuable and we cover how to model it in our other training modules. Now as it turns out this third monetization strategy is the one that Eon selected. Um, so Eon chose to remain long. It didn't lock in the value or hedge its exposure immediately and it waited. And as it turns out, with the benefit of hindsight now, Eon executed its strategy perfectly. Now, this chart presents monthly contracted spot prices uh, to Japan over the course of 2014, which is a good proxy for, for Northeast Asian spot price levels. And as we see in the chart, when Eon loaded its cargo in August, it was essentially acquiring a long cargo position at the lowest prices of the year up until that point. Or as traders would say, Eon bought the lows. And then in October, when Eon sold this cargo to PetroChina, it actually received an estimated price of $14.50. As we see, prices had risen considerably from August through October. And this was just before the market began sinking again as we entered the winter. So Eon essentially sold the highs for the remainder of the year. So when we look at the sale price that Eon realized, from PetroChina, which was $14.50. And we net out the freight and storage costs of $4.29. We find that Eon realized a net price of $10.21, which is almost a dollar above their $9.25 cost for this cargo. And more precisely, it's uh, 96 cents per MMBTU of delivered cargo profit. When we multiply by the delivered cargo, which was just over 3.2 million MMBTU, we estimate a realized net profit of about $3.1 million on this reload and re-export transaction.